we're recording this. Um, you can see it later. Uh, in order to be able to see the presenters uh, in video, you need to turn on your video. Um, uh, just a little bit about the program uh, before we get started. We're going to have a, about an hour. Uh, we can go longer if, if, uh, if there's a lot of questions. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask these questions along um, the program as we're going through. Uh, we will take questions as we're going through and depending on uh, what the questions are and how relative is to the subject. Also, uh, so you can go to the Q&A section and post your questions there. Uh, I will be the moderator for the questions as we're going along. Um, also, uh, just want to say that um, uh, it, because this is live, uh, we're going to try the best we can in order to, you know, answer questions and uh, and, and fit everything here. Um, with these programs that we're doing, we, we have live programs on Monday at 11, um, we, which are uh, broadcasted on YouTube. Uh, and this program today is all about educating entrepreneurs uh, and startups about what it takes to really start and grow companies and potentially finance companies as well. Uh, also, I want to mention that Garrett is also a member of Tech Techos Angels, uh, just like I am. And he's very familiar with what it takes to be uh, an entrepreneur. I'm sure Colin is as well. I just wanted to mention that Garrett is also a, a member of TCA. Um, I just wanted to just talk very briefly about what Pismo Ventures does. Pismo Ventures really helps entrepreneurs. Um, we we help them. Um, we are kind of a, an accelerator and a venture firm at the same time. We help entrepreneurs with many aspects. One is we help them with their business side, whatever I call it, everything startup, whatever it takes to help uh, these businesses with their startup needs. We also have a software development arm. We can help them with developing software as most uh, startups need software nowadays. We also help facilitate funding. Uh, we invest um, resources, including our services and, um, and also cash into our portfolio companies. We open doors to make sure they're successful. Um, we're also building a fund this year to help um, to help uh, uh, also invest in our startup uh, in our um, uh, portfolio companies. We are a value-based hybrid and cash uh, cash and equity uh, startup friendly model. We engage only on a month-to-month -month basis, no long-term contracts, so you can fire us anytime. And we are a true business partner and investor in in, in the startup ecosystem. All right. So before we get started, I'd like to have um, uh, Garrett uh, give us a quick background uh, on on yourself, and then and then Colin can follow with uh, background on himself, and then you guys can take it over. Perfect. Thanks, JJ. We are super excited to be here. We uh, we love what JJ and and Fismo Ventures are doing for startups and entrepreneurs. When he asked us to do this, we we're very excited to say yes. This admittedly is not our normal format. Um, we are pretty interactive typically. And so in this format, we can't really see you. We especially can't see each other, which is tough because I have a bunch of hand signals that I give Colin when he rambles on too long that he's not gonna be able to see. And since we only have about an hour here, um, you, you guys might hear a lot more of him than you want to. Um, mm. But we will, we will do our best to spend the next you know, 30, 45 minutes or so giving you as much of the golden nugget content as we can from our sales mindset for entrepreneurs class that we teach at, at Marshall at USC. Um, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions, which as JJ said, if you just want to type those in, normally we, we just kind of let you popcorn in as we go. But if you want to type them in um, to the chat box, then JJ will moderate and, and get those going for us. Um, so yeah, we'll start off just with, with some introductions and then dig into the good stuff. Does that sound good, Colin? Uh, can you guys see my, my title screen, uh, JJ or Colin? Am I showing the right thing here? Yep, we can see you. Okay. Yep. You're good. Perfect. Perfect. All right, so quick intros and then we'll get into the good stuff. So uh, I'm Garrett. Um, I actually started my career as an attorney. So I was, was not thinking about sales or didn't know anything about sales at the beginning. I just I went to law school, wanted to delay the real world, got sucked up into it and ended up practicing law for about three years. Um, but during that time, which was a miserable time for me personally, because it just wasn't the, the job for me, I was representing um, entrepreneurs and startups. I was a corporate attorney, so I would help companies form and I would help them do all kinds of great things. 
Um, and it just looked a whole lot more fun on the other side of the table. So there was a point after about three years where I decided that uh, I needed to get into the, into the startup world instead of the law world. And so I left um, and ended up joining a company that had just raised about $10.5 million to build. At the time, they, they raised it to build fantasy sports games, which for me was awesome because I was into that back then. And I was able to, uh, to join them as their first salesperson selling corporate sponsorships for fantasy sports games primarily. Um, after about three months, the person who hired me left. Uh, we had just brought in a new CEO and I had closed some deals uh, for the company and the new CEO brought me into his office and he said, hey Garrett, you know, uh, you've know, you done a pretty good job these first three months. Do you think you can keep doing it? And I said, yes, I think I can. Um, I don't see why not. And he said, great, you now run sales and business development. And I said, this is fucking awesome. I was a, uh, I was a miserable attorney three months ago and now I'm at a startup and I'm running a division and we've got money and we're growing and it was exciting. And so I spent the, the next three years there really just learning sales in the fire and building a team and just doing it the hard way. Um, we built that company up. We pivoted out of just fantasy sports and ended up building games as a service and putting them on a bunch of platforms. We're able to sell that company after about three years for, a, you know, it was a modest sale. It was fun to go through the experience, but it didn't change anybody's lives. Um, the most life changing thing about that experience was the people that I met. So uh, the, the head of product and the head of technology for that company told me as we were packaging it up to sell, don't go too far. We've got an idea. So shortly after we sold the, uh, the game company, uh, we started, there was a company, there were four of us from the, the game company went on to be the founding team at Vidium. So the founders, um, Scott and Eric, as I said, ran product and technology, brought me in to do everything that was non-technical. So sales, marketing, cleaning toilets, you know, you guys are all entrepreneurs or at least familiar enough to know that you kind of got to do it all. So we, um, we started building that up. And for the first year and a half, essentially, I was the only non-technical person, started to finally build a sales team and, and generate our sales. And I realized about a year and a half in that I needed to bring on an expert to really help us scale that team. Um, and Colin ended up being that expert. I won't steal his thunder. I'll let him kind of talk about how we met and bonded over our approach to sales, which is what we're going to talk about with you guys today. Um, but then for the next, you know, three or four years with Colin together, we, we helped build that company and the sales team up. We were at about 50 people. And in 2017, we sold that company to Google. Um, and that was one of those big, crazy kind of life-changing um, uh, acquisitions that you dream about. So that was really exciting. I then went to Google after that for a little over six months on a contract to just help transition everything, transition our customers and our go-to-market strategy. Um, and I spent a lot of that time really just learning about how Google works, how one of the biggest companies ever works. So learning about how they hire and learning about how their sales teams operate and learning about how they do their objectives and key results and, and you know, all of these, as much as I could possibly learn, even, even personal development stuff like mindfulness and they, they have classes for everything. Um, so I spent a lot of time learning that. When I then left Google, um, Colin and I opened up, uh, officially opened up our consulting agency, Ag Agency 18, where we help companies build and scale sales teams um, and help them transition to sales forward cultures without abandoning the values and, and the, the skill sets that got them to wherever they might be. Um, I also, as JJ said, started investing in companies and advising companies. And then, of course, my, my favorite thing that we started doing was Colin and I officially, after guest lecturing for many years, started teaching our class, Sales Mindset for Entrepreneurs at USC. And as a fourth generation Trojan, that was a big deal for me, it still is. Um, and we've been doing that now for a couple of years and, and it's, it's a fixture on the permanent schedule now. So that's a, a lot of the content we're gonna try to touch on quickly today. Um, but I think that's the, the quick overview and I will turn it over to Colin and hopefully he's quick so we can get into the fun stuff too. Wow, th th wait a second, wait a second. So you started as an attorney and I and did to a sales guy. What an oxymoron. <laughs> well, maybe I don't, I, I, it's a longer conversation, but you could argue that they're selling all day long. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Good. Good. No, I'm just joking. All right. Call and take it. <laughs> well, well, it. It makes sense. I mean, I've definitely called Garrett a moron before. So like I understand. <laughs> really. I was going to say this is, this is going to be good considering that Garrett has made fun of me and dropped an F-bomb in the first five minutes. So I'm assuming we're going to have a fun time. Um, I am not a fourth generation Trojan. I graduated UC Santa Barbara in four years, um, which I think is an amazing feat for most people that understand what goes on at UC Santa Barbara over the course of four years. And when I graduated, 
I had a job at a PR firm. And I think the important part of this story before moving forward is I grew up with a real disdain for sales. Like I was just one of those kids that thought that I was better than any salesperson I had ever met, right? There was this stigma attached to it and a really well-deserved stigma that has been carried through, you know, snake oil salespeople a hundred years ago to car salespeople now. And, and it just really resonated with me. So like I would be the guy that would walk into a Nordstrom's and if a salesperson would come towards me, I would stare up in the sky. I just did not like sales or salespeople. And it was the last thing that I had planned on doing or engaging in um, post graduating from college. Um, when I graduated college, the PR firm asked me to stay in Santa Barbara when our initial contract was for me to move home to LA. So I had a choice to make, which was stay in Santa Barbara or move back home to LA and find my dream PR job. So I chose to come back home to LA and after a couple of months, I realized that I was not going to be able to find this dream PR job in a matter of weeks and I was running out of money. So I had two choices as this 21 year old kid, which was either live with my parents, which was unacceptable after four years on the beach, or get any job that someone would pay me for. And that just happened to be sales. And so long story short, I just was really bad at it. Like it was karma at its finest, if you think about it. I spent you know the last 21 years or so making fun of salespeople. And now like I am in the most like swarmy profession ever around 50 year olds and 60 year olds and even you know like 40 and 30 year olds that just the worst salespeople you could think about. Like when you think about the definition of a bad salesperson, they're around me and they're doing better than me and they're thriving. And I'm just doing what most college kids fresh out of college would do, which is like justifying why I'm bad, right? Like I'm just smarter than them or they're just manipulators or I mean, you name it. I was having those internal conversations. After two months of not selling anything on the third month, um, I was presented with a pit which some of you know, hopefully none of you know what that is, but it's a, a performance improvement plan, which is a nice way of saying, good try, you haven't sold zilch in two months, and in the third month, you are about to get fired if you do not put up numbers. And I knew I wasn't gonna put up numbers because I hated everything about it. So I decided to show up exactly in the opposite fashion that they had trained us to, because I had nothing to lose. So I was like, screw it, this month, I just gonna do whatever I want to do. Like, I'm only gonna laugh at jokes that are funny. Like, I'm go only gonna ask questions that I actually want to know the answers to. I'm, I'm, I'm literally going to be the antithesis of the salesperson that they have trained everyone in this room to be for the last three months. And obviously, that was the month that I crushed it. And 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 when I say crush it, just to quantify this so that you know how horrible and amazing of a situation this is. I made $36,000 that month, and my dream job in PR was $36,000 for the year. So now I hated sales. I found myself being good at it, and I didn't know why, and I was making enough money where I could not leave as a 21-year-old, newly graduated salesperson. Um, the goal in it was this modality that was for me, that the best salespeople were the ones that were showing up as the exact opposite of what people were expecting a salesperson to look like and sound like and talk like. And, and that, that really transcended all verticals of that company. I ended up being the youngest regional director. I ended up being the youngest vice president. I ended up getting that, that, that company to acquisition um, about six years in, transitioned into being sales directors in the business intelligence space, um, and then transitioned into being a national sales director and then an SVP of global sales um, in the app space. I will spare you guys some of the fun stories I have. Um, but one story that always resonates with people is that I was in a room with Puff Daddy and like 200 cameras with his intent to make fun of me on camera because that's what he does really well. And for some strange reason, he decided to compliment me on my salesmanship in front of what felt like a live studio audience. And then the next day I got poached by the competition, which at the time was Mobile Roadie. I um, ended up leading that team and company through an acquisition. And then I got a call from a recruiter post-acquisition. And they said, hey, Colin, like, we know you think the entertainment industry is sexy. If you want to know what's really sexy? And I said, what? 
and he said software security. And uh, I met Garrett the next week, and we just fell in love. And we fell in love around this idea that like sales didn't have to be like what we had both viewed it as and really stayed away from coming up and through the way. And that like sales as a profession could be something that people could be proud of. And that we we found that when we when we discussed who the best salespeople in the world we've ever met throughout our combined, you know, 35, 36 years of sales experience was that it wasn't the salespeople that had the ability to overcome objections. Like they weren't the most extroverted. Like they, they weren't even the, the best listeners or the best question askers. They had the highest emotional intelligence. And it's such a buzzword, but at the time it wasn't. You know, like five, six years ago, Gary and I sat in a room and it was a statement, like a high EQ directly correlates to a high sales IQ. And this idea around like, if you are self-aware enough to know that when you say some shit and it doesn't land, do you have the ability to course correct real time? Like, are you socially aware enough to understand that people recognize when you are waiting to speak and you're not actually listening? And like, what does that look like? And how does that play out? Like, are you optimistic or even pathologically optimistic to a point and maybe even to a fault when you expect people to purchase from you and therefore you treat them like you're already on the same team? And how does that live if you're treating someone like you're on the same team? And so all of these these data points um, just, just took Garrett and I to a really elevated place. And we used Bidium as a microcosm for this larger play um, that we really believe in, this mission to restore sales to the integrity that we believe um, it, it should it should be at, um, and, and it wasn't, and it still isn't. And so post-acquisition, um, Garrett and I just took it on our backs, and we started teaching at USC, and USC said, hey, listen, like, we don't have any sales courses at the undergrad level, and like what, what we've seen from you guys during your guest lectures makes a lot of sense, because like everyone we talk to, we will make them realize that they're salespeople, especially being labeled a salesperson. So when Garrett talks about our class, you know, think about our class as it's comprised of three different groups of people. And you have students that want to sell ideas, right? They want to go raise money. They want to be CEOs. Um, you have people that want to sell themselves, right? They want to they want to sell themselves in interviews. They want to sell themselves in relationships. They want to get promotions. But they actually want to own their true, authentic version of themselves. And then the third group are actual sales practitioners and they want to graduate and they want to sell services and they want to sell products. Um, but combined, what we realized is if you want to be the greatest salesperson that no one's ever met, like you have to show up as the antithesis of what people think a great salesperson is. So I will pause there and send it back to Garrett before he interrupts me and makes fun of me for the second time. All right. first time this, is, this is good, Colin. Now I'm so intrigued with all this background, now you're gonna make me a salesperson. So, so I want to know how. <laughs> so, okay, let me, let me just it you are a salesperson, okay? <laughs> that, that is a lot of background, isn't it, JJ? See, I would have in real life, I would have given him the hand signal about three minutes ago. But there was actually, in Colin's defense, there's there's actually a lot of stuff to unpack there um, around yeah. emotional intelligence and the fact that. As it, I hope, says on your screen, because I have no idea how to use the Zoho uh, yeah. uh, webinar <laughs> feature, but no, nobody wants to deal with a typical salesperson. Anytime the phone rings and it's a phone number that, that we don't know, we're not answering the phone because we know it's a salesperson or e even in a store, right? Unless you really need some help and know what you want. When the salesperson comes over and asks if you need help, you're either kind of dodging them or you're saying, no, I'm fine. And that's because we've all been burned so many times before. Um, by salespeople, by, by people who are, who are doing it wrong or with disingenuous intentions or if they're using, you know, any sales tactic that we talk about today or any sales tactic that you read about in any book, you can weaponize that sales tactic and you can use that to, to pull one over on somebody. And, and too many salespeople do that. And that's why salespeople have this bad name. Um, and, and that's why nobody likes a typical salesperson. So what we're going to kind of talk about as much as we can here is how does this play out in the real world? How do the best salespeople on the planet act in a really surprising, atypical, unusual way and do things differently? 
And Colin, I don't, uh, you know, we're going to bounce around all over the place. I don't know if you have any, any special place to start, but I was thinking I would talk for a second just about how they use questions. And then we can, we can branch out from there, unless you have anything that we missed here. No, that's great. Let's start with questions. Perfect. So if any sales folks are in the room, and again, I can't see anything but my slide here on this thing. So I don't know if there's questions or even anybody listening. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're in this room and you're a salesperson and you think about the questions that you ask to prospects and potential customers, chances are, if you're typical, you're asking those questions to gather information. You want to learn about their business. You want to learn what their pain points are. And certainly that's important. But what we have seen with really highly emotional intelligence, the top salespeople in the world, is that they're not asking questions oftentimes to, to hear the answer of the person they're asking it to. They're asking a question so that the person they're asking can hear themselves answer or at least hear themselves think about that answer. And I don't, and I don't want to fly over that concept because, like, you know, we, we teach this for 16 weeks. Like, questions is an entire two-hour course that we're not going to be able to get to in the next, you know, 20 minutes. But, like, what Garrett just said is very, very important. Like, the greatest salespeople that we've ran into, they are adding value by asking questions. And typical salespeople are extracting value by asking questions. It's like a typical salesperson is asking questions that you know the answer to, to, to essentially get enough ammo to create the roadmap to the sale. I'm not faulting them for that. It's just obvious and you smell it a, a, a mile away, right? But, but the, the, let's just call it the other salesperson, right? The one that we're referencing, the one that we teach about, this modality that Garrett and I really embody, like they're asking questions that you intentionally hopefully don't have the answer to. Like I am adding value by asking a question you don't have the answer to so that you can ideate in real time and that you have new information because of my probing. Like that is such a key distinction. And if that is emotional intelligence like in its finest, right? Is like, if you can take ownership of your answer, I am not selling you, right? Like you are choosing to purchase and that's not manipulation. That's just an example of how a typical salesperson asks questions and how let's just call this a, a atypical salesperson asks questions. So I just want to make sure that I draw a fine point on that gear because I think it's really important. And it's also, I think, pervasive in our society, especially during COVID. Like think about COVID right now. Like Garrett and I are getting salespeople to reach out to us every single day. Some are borderline offensive because they're not even acknowledging the current state, right? And some just just are are disgraceful in in the art of sales, right? They're just doing it wrong. It's like this is an opportunity for the first time ever for a salesperson to be vulnerable and have permission to be vulnerable. So you've got a typical salesperson that is like is that reaches out to you and says, "Hey, like I hope I hope your family's doing okay. Listen, this is now the time to buy. This is where the opportunity is. Let me show you why you should purchase this." Like you've never had an opportunity to have a shared experience with someone where you are on the same team out the gate. Like why would you ruin it by doing that? Like we're talking to great salespeople that are using vulnerability as their access point. Like they're having conversations and they're saying, hey, like, just so you know, I have no idea what to do with this. Like, like I, I don't, I don't know. I've never done this before. You know what I mean? Like, like help me. Like, I know that like, you, that you saw value in our product, but at the same time, like there's so many more important things going on, like in our world right now. Like, just, just let me know. Like, is this even a conversation that we should be having right now? Like that vulnerability, the ability to tell your story so that people will tell their story is what Garrett's talking about when he's talking about the difference between a typical salesperson and an atypical salesperson. So let me ask, let me ask this question uh, that just came in. Um, can, can an introvert be a good salesperson? Uh, Colin or Garrett, either one? Garrett, this is like our favorite question, right? I'll start and I'll like finish. Um, Go for it. Introverts are typically the best salespeople because no one is expecting you or smells the stench of sales. Like introverts will make you earn your smile. Introverts are coming in, like there's two lanes with salespeople. 
right? There's like the lane where like, hey, I'm an actual salesperson. I have a commission that I need to earn. I'm going to ask you to buy. I'm going to present all the information. You can give me a yes or you can give me a no. Just don't give me a maybe. Sound good? We'll part as friends either way. And actually, that's like really surprising to a lot of people. Like they'll appreciate that authenticity. You have another salesperson in a whole nother lane that says, I am just a consultant. I take a consultative approach. I'm going to give you all the information. Let's just call this person an introvert, right? Like, I, I don't care if you buy. I am not going to be louder than you. I don't choose to be. Like, I'm smart and I understand my lane. When and if you want to buy, that's totally fine. That's really great, too, because people are now buying versus being sold. And that always happens on the introvert side. The challenge with salespeople is when they switch or when they merge lanes. It's when the introvert says, like, I, I don't care if you buy, right? Like, my job is to educate you, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that you'll get 50% off if you buy this week. And then you, <laughs> you know, and but that's they, also, that's showing itself now, too, when you talk about the people who are reaching out during coronavirus, because they start out seemingly authentic, like, I hope your family's okay, I hope everything's okay, and then they switch lanes right away, and they go into selling, and there's, you know, the, instantly, you're like, oh, this person, you know, it, it was completely, um, it was completely inauthentic, what they were talking about, and so, which is important, authenticity is a really important um, thing to talk about when you talk about introverts, and, and why they're good salespeople, um, why some of the best salespeople that Colin and I have seen and hired and worked with uh, were introverts. And it's because they're authentic, it's because of the things that Colin said. They're not trying to be somebody that they're not. They're not putting on the phony smile. They're just being themselves. And people are attracted to authenticity mm. in anyone, not just salespeople, but, but especially in salespeople. Like if you know that somebody's being true to themselves, then you, then you probably figure they're gonna be true to you too in terms of understanding what you want, making sure that, that things are right, making sure that you're taken care of, so. That's a really good point. We, Garrett and I had the pleasure of working with a really great salesperson that was an extrovert and did not know that they were a great salesperson. Um, and she, and she had, like she owned the vertical. Like she knew everything that there was to know about her space and her product and her customer demographic. I mean, she, she, she knew her playbook inside and out. Um, and, and for her, like her challenge was she was trying so hard to be the inauthentic version of herself because she thought that's what a salesperson had to be. And so she would, you know, it was, she would smile when at the most unfunniest things, like she would laugh because she thought it was a superpower and really it was her kryptonite. And so Gary and I spent a lot of time with her. And one of the things that we said was like, hey, try only smiling like when you actually want to. Right, just see what happens because she had the most amazing smile. And so she did. And what ended up happening was, and I think I referenced it earlier, the minute that she laughed and she smiled because it was her showing up in the most authentic version of herself, and then she didn't anymore, you had the customer chasing the smile. Like you had the customer chasing the passion and trying to elicit that from her. Um, needless to say, like she's she was always a great salesperson, but she's she is now she's now elevated herself into a leadership role because like trying to be someone you're not is just super obvious. And it's so that's the authenticity, that's authenticity you're talking about that made a huge difference there. That's for sure. Like, uh, Garrett and I do a lot of a lot of logic and emotion. If you can't tell, right? Like I am the logical one, and Garrett's the emotional one. Really. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that lands as hard over over the internet. But if you see that person, you will you would know that that's funny. <laughs> all right, all right. So let, let me let me ask you this one because I think um, everybody's probably waiting. Uh, I, I'm I'm anxiously waiting to uh, for the answer of this one because it's becoming a buzzword: emotional intelligence. Yeah. I mean, how how do you build emotional intelligence? Or, or is it already kind of pre-built, fixed, pre-born with people? So is it something you could learn or or not? Yeah, we get that question a lot too. This, is, this group has a lot of the uh, common questions that we get, which is which is totally great. So um, the good, you know, I think we're told as kids a lot that your IQ is fixed. And that may or may not be true, depending on, on what you read and, and what you look at. Um, and but, but emotional intelligence is absolutely not fixed. 
And the reason for that is because it's built on things that get stronger and that you build on the more life experience you have. It's, you know, self-awareness and social awareness and motivation and empathy and all these things that you just don't have as a young person um, or that you do, but that you're constantly building as you get more life experience. So all of the, the things that we teach when we're talking about asking questions in a different way or anything, you know, some of all the other things that we're going to try to get uh, into uh, today as we talk about this stuff, all that stuff is is towards building emotional intelligence. And it's like anything, though. You, you have to stay in the gym and you have to work the muscle. Um, and so the best salespeople on all of the teams that we have worked with and seen are the ones who are consciously trying to build that muscle. And they're doing it through honest self-reflection. They'll look in the mirror and they'll go, was I, you know, was I listening or was I actually just waiting to speak? Um, and, and I think a lot of people, a lot, especially early in people's sales careers, um, they're really just waiting to speak because they have that script. They already know the answer. They want to be perfect. Um, they want they, they've, they've got the counter to the objection. Um, but as you, as you get older and, and get more experience, you realize that, that, um, you know, that's not what people are attracted to. And that's, people don't want to be wrong. And a lot of salespeople, um, they get themselves into trouble because, you know, they've got all the answers to all the objections here. And somebody says, you know, I can't buy because it doesn't have the, the right this or that. And you've got, oh, I'm in my playbook. I know that we can actually overcome that because X, Y, Z. And then the, uh, the uh, person that you're selling to goes, yeah, but I'm not buying. And the reason is because you were right. Like you have to have that, that emotional intelligence to understand that people want to be part of the sales experience and not just be told what's going on and not just be sold to. They want to actually, they want to actually interact and, and feel like it's their decision. And I don't, and I don't want to gloss over that because that was that that th those were both two very powerful points in our class. We call them fuego points. Uh, you know, one is like emotional intelligence is not the act of listening versus waiting to speak. Like that's not what emotional intelligence emotional intelligence is. Emotional intelligence is looking in the mirror and acknowledging I am the type of person that is not listening and I am waiting to speak. Like it is that self-awareness. I'd also like to say that like our mindset, our modality, like EQ or emotional intelligence is just one pillar of it. And it is an overused buzzword and it sucks that it is because it is really important, but it's only one component. And so, you know, when you, when you think about, you think about all of these conversations that are being had on a day-to-day -day basis with salespeople, one common underlying theme across all of the great ones is that they use one muscle really, really well. And that, and that is the ability to look for the good and find it. Like There are so many salespeople out there that are looking for the bad in their customers and finding it um, as opposed to the opposite. And, you know, our brain is so malleable. It's a beautiful thing, but like it works, right? So it's like, it will find evidence to support whatever it is that you are thinking about. So if you are looking for reasons why your customer does not want to buy from you, why they are manipulating you, like why they are just using you as, as a data point to drive down cost for, you know, the other competitor in the RFP, like you will be right. But if you are also looking for reasons why like your your customer like wants to do business with you, that, that your customer acknowledges that your product or service, as special as it is, is a commodity because everything is being commoditized. And at the end of the day, they're going to have to make a decision primarily based on like who they're going to have to spend more time with. And they're going to choose to spend more time with you. Like that is not an easy skill set to create, let alone maintain. So when Garrett talks about like staying in the gym, like looking for the good and finding it, like we do so many exercises just in terms of like research, discovery, um, like access points, like reaching out, like that. there's an entire conversation that we don't have time for just around looking for the good. But I want to tie that back to emotional intelligence, because if you're not self-aware or socially aware enough to realize that you're not looking for the good, it doesn't matter like what you're doing like, at all. That's, that's really, really good. Um, it's very intriguing. I, I have two questions. Um, hey, JJ, can, one, I, can I finish up on that on that last point before you dig into the extra question? So 
Colin's wife calls it pathological optimism. She calls him a pathological optimist, and she wasn't com complimenting him when she originally coined the term. But we have we have taken that and run with it, and kind of I, kind of quantified, uh, or at least put a label on the way that these these best salespeople in the world um, focus on optimism. And so, for for those of you again that are listening that are in sales, you know that sales is a tough profession. You are getting told no pretty much constantly, right? And on, obviously it depends on the industry and the product that you're selling, but on a typical sales team, a person closing 20 or 30% of their opportunities is among the best salespeople on the team. That means you're getting told no a lot. And so what happens is a typical salesperson, they start to get desperate and they start to think about their commission check and, and rent and all the things, you know, and they start to then do what we talked about earlier, what people are kind of doing during this coronavirus and this, this economic challenge is they're, they're firing out more. They figure, okay, I send 100 and I, and I close this many. If I send 1,000, I'm going to close 10 times more. But that's, that's just not how it works. Um, and so the best, the best salespeople instead are, are optimists and they're looking for these opportunities and finding them a lot more often than other people are. I just wanted to point that out. Before we that's, change, that's uh, great. Change Thank years. you. So uh, Wayne, I don't know if you know Wayne. Um, he's a TCA member. He just he's asking a question. Uh, by the way, congrats, Wayne, on your uh, new CEO position. Um, so he says, what advice would you give the sales guy who everyone loves, builds great rapport, but just can't seem to close? Is it important to ask for a close? So, and when it's so funny when you ask that question, I have somebody that we've worked with. I mean, I've a bunch of people, but one in particular, because, you know, that's always a challenge for somebody who does not naturally identify as a salesperson, which is Colin and I said, we started out that way too. Um, you feel like you're asking something. So the key there is value. And if you're doing your job the right way as a salesperson, you are adding more value than you are extracting in every single interaction. So you're not just sending an email and saying, when can you talk and give me time? You're sending something with it or, or adding some value. And value can be anything. It can be something related to knowledge of your product. It can be something related to knowledge of the industry because there's a real weapon that we have as salespeople um, in most cases, which is that we are experts in the room. We're talking to people just like our customers all day long. So we get to call them up or send them emails and, and say, hey, I talk to people just like you all day and this is what I'm hearing. And you can give that value to them could just be a laugh, a, a chuckle, you know, something, something funny. There's a lot of different ways to add value. But if you are adding more value than you are extracting and you've done your job um, and that is your job, then you should feel very confident and comfortable asking for the money at the end because you've done your homework. You know that what you have is going to add more value, hopefully, than you're taking um, in their life. And it becomes a lot more comfortable. So it's less for us as the sales mindset guys. It's less about let's learn closing tactics and I need to do trial closes. All that stuff's important. You got to know the basics and, and you certainly have to do that in a way that feels authentic to you. But it's even more important to focus on adding more value than you're extracting so that you feel confident asking for that money at the end. Yeah, and I'll, I'm going to add to that, AJ, because yeah. Wayne, it's a, it's a really good question. And I have been in the shoes multiple times uh, with, with having really exceptional natural rapport builders that just can't close a door, you know, like let alone close a deal. And, and the reason is because they have limiting beliefs, like regardless of if they're acknowledging it or not. I mean, that's not to say that, that they, that they're not asking for the money enough. And that's true, right? Like if you wait until the end to ask for the money, it's all blue skies and everything's amazing. And this is the most perfect thing ever. And you're going to love this. And I'm your friend and you already love me. And then boom, you ask for the money and you crash and burn. That happens all the time, right? That's sales one on one. You read a book about it, do some trial closes, ask for the money, you know, six or seven times, like in the right, correct way, so that by the time that you actually ask for the money, like it's not a shock. That's basic. What what I actually find, and Garrett and I see it all the time, is that the best rapport builders they have this limiting belief that they will come off inauthentic they will come off cheesy they will come off like they are switching lanes like i referred to earlier the minute they ask for the money and so we have some exercises that we do and they really do work even though they might sound uh, more cliche than than i'd like it to over, over a webinar um, but like if you were to ask 
you know, if you were to ask the salesperson, okay, like, what do you think your limiting belief is? You know, like, like if you, like if you had to isolate, like, like the money, the answer, if he or she is being honest, is I'm uncomfortable asking for the money because it's going to completely just take apart the relationship that I built, right? Or it's going to make me sound cheesy or it's going to make me sound like a typical salesperson. So, so we have this limiting belief exercise where we call it an opposite actionable statement. And an example would be this. And we got, this is actually a real example. I'm afraid to ask for the money because I'm going to sound like a typical salesperson. The opposite actionable statement is if I don't ask for the money and they talk about the money first, I am going to sound like a cheesy, typical, manipulating salesperson. So I better bring up the money before they do or they're going to think I'm hiding something. Or like, I don't want to ask for the money because it just, it, it's not, it doesn't feel right to me. You know, I'm not a closer. I'm an opener, right? The opposite action will stay. And I, and I want to add value, right? The opposite action will statement is like, I'm not going to be able to add value unless these guys purchase and these guys aren't going to purchase unless like I ask for the money. So there's a bunch of them and we can take it offline and give you some exercises that we use with our students, but it, it really does work. And unfortunately, we all have limiting belief systems and we just don't acknowledge them. We don't do personal SWOT analysis, right? Like we don't look at our threats. We don't look at our weaknesses. Like we want to focus on everything else. We don't take ownership of it. And that's that self-awareness that we're talking about. So it's a really good question. And we've seen it, like we have seen a quick turnaround um, for people that can acknowledge that they have limiting beliefs and then actually do something about it. All right. Very, very good. I, so I, I want to ask a question, not to take a lot of time, maybe 30 seconds on that, uh, and I'll follow up with a second question. But when we had lunch, you and I and Garrett, before this COVID-19 stuff, we talked about what's business development versus sales? Is it the same thing or is it not? <laughs> Just not too long, but because I, <laughs> yeah. I hear it all the time. Seconds. I get that done. <laughs> five seconds and I'll let Garrett give 25 seconds. The five seconds is it's just a way to not use sales in your title because you're embarrassed. And by the way, this is for someone that has a chief revenue officer title. Same thing. Okay. You're just embarrassed. Oh, okay. I got it. <laughs> not your fault. It's the industry's <laughs> fault. They've created a stigma and we haven't done a good enough job removing it. Garrett, 15 seconds to you. Yes, and a lot of times today we see that the business development role is more of like going after chunks of customers at a time, places where you can you can get chunks of leads. We, we, we won't have time to talk about it today. It's a little bit off topic, but one of the things that we are big proponents of is bringing sales and marketing together as one unit under like a revenue unit as opposed to keeping them separate because there's this historical battle between the two that always ends up happening of like, you're bringing me leads, you're, or you're not bringing me enough leads and they say well we are but you're not closing them and, and you know that's a whole other uh, webinar probably but business development fits in there in, almost in both ways because they through more of a sales strategic tactical methods are are going out and trying to get chunks of customers the same way marketing is um but but colin's right and and our mission which i don't know if, how clear we were on it at the beginning is to is to change the way that the world feels about salespeople. that's why we do this that's why we teach the class that's why we're writing the book because so many people do it wrong that they're embarrassed to put sales in their title and so our hope is that if we can get enough people like the folks on this webinar and our students and everybody else to start doing it the right way then we don't have to hide behind the fact that we're selling it's a welcome a, a conversation to have because the person on the other end of that phone or, or on the other side of the table knows I'm going to get information and then I'm going to make an informed decision. Is this right for me or is it not for whatever reason? And one final thought, JJ, I'm not going to be long winded. I promise. Garrett, <laughs> is Sales has to be an extension of every department. And, and every department has to be an extension of sales. Like the engineers have to understand like what the salespeople are doing and why and how they're selling their product. Just as much as salespeople need to understand why engineers are building and creating and how they are mobilizing and why it's important to them. And so we yeah. do a bunch of work on making sure that like that, that is true. And if that works out well, 
then everyone in the space understands like at some point, like sales is in their title. It's just inherent in everyone's job duties at some point or another. Everybody's selling. Okay, all right, that's that's really good. Uh, what about, uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest questions for today, is what are the most important things for an entrepreneur to think about when building a sales team from scratch? And and not only just, let's let's talk about also if 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 you have only two people as part of a startup so what is the most yeah. important thing as an entrepreneur to think about that's a super important question and the and the good surprising news is colin and i have slightly different answers to this but one of the things that we will both talk about is focusing on scalability from the very beginning so what happens early on um with with most startups is that you've got the founding team and they're doing all the sales as they should um, because they need to be out there having conversations with customers and figuring out exactly um, what they need to build and how they need to sell and all that good stuff. The problem is then you start to hire salespeople and you expect them to then go on that same journey. And what you didn't do was get the stuff that's between your ears onto a proper sales playbook and start thinking about scalability and the culture that you're going to build from uh, from a sales standpoint right from the very beginning. So whenever we talk to founders or even like the first VP of sales type hire, we're really talking about getting that playbook started as quickly as possible. And, you know, what kinds of things go into a playbook? You can Google that and there's tons of it. Colin and I have our own opinions about really focusing on making sure that everybody understands culturally why was the company founded. We talked about questions earlier in a question bank. So there should absolutely, anytime you have a good question, um, that that causes a customer to think or 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 um, you know learn something that they didn't know before. That question needs to go into the sales playbook. And so as the team grows, the salespeople, you know, we're lazy. We don't necessarily want to go as soon as we have a call and then go start writing down good questions. We want to keep that stuff for ourselves, or it's just easier to not do it. So what we try to do is focus on incentivizing and building the culture of putting that stuff in the playbook right away. So one thing that that Colin did uh, with the sales team that he worked with was. He did a spiff for any time uh, a salesperson got a prospect to say, that's a good question, or I hadn't thought of that, or something along those lines. They put that down into the playbook, and whoever had the most at the end of the week got a cash spiff. And that, you know, so there's looking for ways to incentivize documenting those types of things, story banks, and of course, objections and, and sound bites and, and all the stuff that needs to go in there. But Focusing on that scalability from a playbook standpoint and a culture standpoint is where I would start. Yeah, and it's not it's not that it's not that Garrett and I disagree on this. It's just that like you don't like if you have a great playbook and you have great hiring practices and you have a shitty culture, by the way, culture, another way overused buzzword, but we're gonna use it now because it's important. Like you don't have anything if you don't have culture. Like Garrett and I needed to figure out a way to make sure that our team was going to be selling to Australia Thursday night at 8 p.m. our time because it was Friday morning there. Like what did we need to do to make sure it was their idea to stay there and work hard and not our idea? Obvious, right? Put a keg in the sales room. So that's what we did. We put a keg in the sales room. We hired right, so we had responsible people. And at 7 p.m. when all their friends were taking shots of Jameson at the bar, right, trying to beat happy hour, our people were in the room, in the sales den, sipping on a beer, talking to Australia, enjoying themselves. There's this, we're, we're writing our book and there's this whole, <laughs> there's, a, there's a phrase of, it's funny actually, it's like, um, if, if the writer's not having fun, the reader's not having fun. And it's the same thing with sales. Like, it's just like you feel it, right? Like if you, we, we all know what it feels like to have like a crush, a school, a schoolyard crush, right? Like you just move differently, right? Like you listen more intently. You're not saying anything different, right? You're just acting different. And, and that, like that emotion really does, like it shines through. And so, yes, you are going to need to have a great interview guide that's scalable. You're going to have to assess drive, selling skills, and personal attributes. You're going to need to make sure that they're coachable, self-aware, that they have integrity. They're going to have to have phone selling skills. They're going to have to be able to develop relationships. They're going to have to be competitive. That makes sense. You're going to have to have a great sales playbook. You're going to have to have a process. You're going to have to have differentiation sound bites. You're going to have to have an opportunity checklist. You're going to have to have rules of engagement. You're going to have to be able to plot out where finish lines are. 
Like you're going to have to be so perfect that you don't sound perfect. Like that's all in training, right? Like that's all wow. stuff. Like that, that's all important, but none of it makes sense. Like none of it will work if you don't have the right sales culture. And, and that's, I think what Garrett meant when he said, you know, like Kyle and I started two different places and we kind of meet in the middle is you got to have people that really thrive. And when I say culture, who has a bigger ego than a salesperson? Who a CEO? <laughs> Maybe a CEO has a bigger ego than a salesperson, but guess who the best salesperson in the room is? The CEO. OK, so like if you know you're dealing with a bunch of like ego maniacal people, you better create the infrastructure to be able to process constructive feedback, to be able to process positive feedback, to know the difference between checking in and actually giving someone constructive feedback. And if you start to use shared vernacular, right, when if, if I tell Garrett, hey, Garrett, the story I'm telling myself is blank, Garrett already knows I'm coming down my ladder, not going up my ladder because we're using the same words because we spend 20% of our extra time on making sure that we process feedback. It's like that's, that's culture 101. That doesn't, there's no shortcuts around it. All right. All right. So we have a bunch of questions. Is it okay if we go a little over? You guys, you're okay with that? Yes. All right. So, um, uh, if you believe in your product and you feel like it's adding a lot of value to your consumer or customer, how much should you really sell it for? <laughs> is this a pricing question? I think it is a pricing question. You know, value pricing versus maybe, you know, cost plus pricing versus, but he, he's, I, I guess the question is around if you're adding a lot of value, can you charge more? Uh, maybe that's how it is. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the pricing question is a tough one, and that, there's no short answer without asking you a bunch of questions about your product and your industry and things like that. But I will say that when we talk to entrepreneurs and even established sales teams about pricing, we always do focus on where you can show value add. And, and by the way, coronavirus situation now is a great opportunity to take some time and step back, especially if you're in one of those industries where your customers aren't answering the phone quite as much, take a percentage of your day, step back and go, okay, what is the pain point that they're feeling and how can I add more value there? Do they need to save money? Do they need to save time? How does my product or service help them do either of those things? And, and just really sit back and reevaluate who is my ideal customer? What's, what's my ICP, my ideal customer profile? And how can I add more value to them? And, and certainly the, the companies and the salespeople that do that are going to have more success selling and hopefully at a higher price. Yeah. And to add to that, you know, you talk about the customer persona, like it's so important. Uh, I, we just kicked off Techstars LA this week again, and I'm a sales mentor for Techstars LA. And, you know, there's a lot of freemium models, like freemium, like is an interesting model. What people don't realize though, is that like, yes, early adopters are actually less price sensitive. So to Garrett's point, like if you have early adopters and you are adding a bunch of value, they will pay for it, especially if their access point was free to begin with. But the expectations are what people don't consider. Like for instance, like they're expecting you to have continuous innovation and be really communicative about it. They're expecting you as a customer Okay, like role reversal here to to be evangelist. Well, how do you do that? So like you have to bake in the value, like as it correlates to the cost. Like I just spent one hundred and ninety seven dollars on a hoodie and I hope my wife never sees this webinar. So that way she won't know that. But I just spent one hundred and ninety seven dollars on a hoodie. The value that these guys presented to me on a B2C front was so astronomical that I probably would have spent 500. And when you see this hoodie, I Garrett hates that I'm saying this, like this is an opportunity where if we were in person, like he would have stopped me and said like I was crazy and this is why I'm not the CFO of our company. But, but that value was real for me. See, the thing is, is like people talk about value. It's not some overarching theme. It is called perceived value for a reason. And you have no idea what perceived value is to someone unless you understand someone's perspective. And you don't understand someone's perspective until you build out that persona. And not just like, hey, this is who they are, but like, this is their dominant buying motive. This is why they're buying. 
These are their objections. This is what it means to them personally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's gotta be part of your playbook as well. And you've gotta be flexible enough so that you can iterate on those personas as you go upstream or as you, you know, bend off onto different verticals. Those are all things that like are very relevant in this value conversation. I, I have to say I'm, right now, I'm, you're making sales so complex and you're trying to make it also simple at the same time but there are a lot of intricate details associated with everything you've been talking about from the emotional intelligence to being authentic to to the way uh, to to how people perceive value the way you present it so there are a lot of things involved and it's not just one thing so next question is from Andrew Andrew Lowe is a friend and he's also a, um, a wealth manager he manages investments so for the past month or so during this COVID time, he said, I've made a lot of, number, a lot of calls uh, to his customer base and prospects trying to add value and support and referrals. His question is, should I use a separate call to ask for business in order to stay in my lane and stay authentic? Mm. So right now you're making calls and you're blending the two. Right, you're like checking in, and then you're also asking for money. I mean, not not to put it bluntly, but that that's essentially what's happening. If I'm hearing you correctly, so Gary and I have been having this conversation a lot. There's a lot of opportunity right now, and, and with with COVID specifically, and I touched on it earlier. Like you have a shared experience, and I'm going to use the word leverage, even though it has a negative connotation, but you have a shared experience that you can leverage right now. Like you and your customers are both going through the same exact thing at the same exact time, which means for the first time ever, like you are on the same team without even trying. So your gut reaction to, to ask the question, should I have a separate call or shouldn't I? My answer is no, you should have one call. And that one call is not asking for money. In fact, that one call is the opposite. The one call is like you call and you check in because you care. And you are so optimistic that you know that when this is over, the money's going to come. And you're also optimistic to know that if they, if, if you have provided enough value continually before COVID and during COVID, that the money is yours already. And if you have those sorts of conversations, like I found it very interesting when a wealth manager reached out to me and didn't pitch a fit. Like it was a really refreshing experience. And I hardly knew the guy, but we had an introductory call. And the phone call sounded like this, like, hey, Colin, like I'm just checking in. I'm like, well, you know, like I think you know how we're doing. You know, we're, we're you know, he, I'm an optimistic. I'm an optimistic guy. I'm like, I'm looking for the gifts and I'm finding them. And he's like, no, me too, man. You know, like I'm talking to a lot of guys that that have um, that have either just uh, that, that are either right in post acquisition experiences or like they they're going through an acquisition or their acquisition halted for some reason. And like what I, what I've been finding is like the best resources for all of them to really stay in tune with what's going on and what their options are, are these tools right here. And he offered me tools that were, that were financial tool agnostic, like for lack of a better word. Like he wasn't pitching himself. He was just pitching options that anyone in the space could leverage. And like in my head, I was like, well, I just feel like this guy added value and didn't extract anything from me. That was a lot more about the space and about making sure I was okay. And a lot less about if you're going to do something, do it with me. And that was kind of convoluted. So Gary, I don't know if you want to rein me in on that. I, I think, I think that's good because we, we still have some questions and we're almost at the end. So um, th this is a difficult question uh, to ask. Um, Mark is asking, I sell recruitment services with high unemployment hiring freezes, how would you position um, for someone to hire recruitment services at this point? You waiting for me, Gary, or do you want to take this one? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> recruiters, you know, recruiters are... So, all right, so, so let me start by saying this. One great thing about really shitty salespeople 
is they make it really easy for good salespeople. So like, you know, like if you're on like a car lot, there's so many shitty <laughs> people that like the minute you find one that's not shitty, it's such a breath of fresh air. The contrast like is, is really obvious. Um, and so don't take this the wrong way, but like recruiters are kind of in that category. Like recruiters, a lot of recruiters really lack tact. I receive an email from a recruiting firm at least once a week and they have my name wrong. For some reason, like Trey seems to come up a lot. Like, hey, Trey, hope you're doing well. I have no idea who Trey is. So like, <laughs> I get that a lot from recruiters. They just, they spray and pray. So I would show up as the exact opposite of how your competition is showing up right now. Like, I don't have the answer, but I know if you go on LinkedIn and you look at your competition and you see what your what the recruiters are doing, like, I would do the exact opposite. In fact, I would start giving away shit for free. That's what I would start doing. Like, the only way that we were going to charge for a webinar today was if we were going to have people donate to a COVID relief fund. Like Garrett and I are actually like on a mission right now to try to find companies that are really being hurt by COVID so that we can consult for them for free. Like it's the last thing that they expect. It's the first thing that they need. And if you do enough good and add enough value and you can afford to do this, that business is yours once the economy turns around. Oh, it's coming back with spades. That's for sure. <laughs> but yeah. that's not even necessary. I mean, it's certainly this part of it. But, but we look at we have friends with companies and they have, you know, they, they have the ability to make hand sanitizer or face masks or, or ventilator parts. And we don't have that. But one thing that we are pretty decent at is, is helping solve sales challenges. And so we looked, you know, once we sat down one day, uh, not in the same room, unfortunately, but over Zoom and we said, what can we do? And, and that's what we came up with. We, we just want to make ourselves available to help and to do, you know, if, it, if it's a lunch and learn, just to ask questions and, and brainstorm. Um, we're going to try to do as much of that as our schedules will allow. So. Um, I think it's a good a good point, and that's we're gonna eat our own dog food there and do it ourselves. I think it's great. All right, last question for the day: um, What is your what what are I should say maybe what are or what is your best tip for cold calling? Mm. You can't put that at the end. That's a <laughs> here's, the, here's the here's the tip for cold calling. The the secret to cold calling is earning ten more seconds. You, we talked about the, the uh, barrier when somebody interacts with a salesperson and realizes it's a salesperson, right? Um, if you're lucky enough to get somebody to answer the phone, don't say, is this a good time? Because it's not a good time. You just interrupted them and now you're a salesperson on the other side of the phone um, <laughs> and, and they don't want to talk to you. So, the, so it's really important to add value right at the beginning to earn the first 10 seconds. That can be something funny um, or something interesting. Uh, but but you got to add value. And again, we don't have time. I'm, hopefully not too many people um, had to jump off right at one. But um, at another time we can do it. We, we do an entire class on cold calling as well. Um, and then from there, you've got to earn another 10 seconds by surprising them and showing them that you're an authentic human being and not just a salesperson. And so and on and on and on um, until you get to whatever the objective is for for your cold call, which usually is to schedule another call. But sometimes it's to close you know, a sale or whatever. So. So the answer to your question is earn the next 10 seconds um, and do it authentically and, and for the right reasons. And I'll give, um, you the, I'll give you the back half of that, even though this, is, this really is worthy of an entire two hour session. When Garrett talks about earning the next 10 seconds, the only way that you can do that is if you know where the finish line is and you've identified it before calling. Like if you're calling and you're saying, Hey, like I am calling from Pismo Ventures. I uh, have you heard of us before? Like the person that is on the other end of that phone line is thinking, "Oh, that's the finish line." So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna say no. I won. Goodbye. I'm but done. The salesperson's finish line. The salesperson's finish line was after they say no, and that is my opportunity to be a human being for the first time. So I get to go, oh, you haven't heard of us before? Okay, let me take a step back. Let me tell you why I'm calling, and you can tell me if it's even a conversation worth having. Oh, shit. Oh, my God, this person's a human being, not a salesperson. I'll give him 10 seconds, and then I'll say no. But I'm going to give him 10 seconds because I knew where my finish line was, and it was after he said no. But he thought the finish line was saying no. 
And that is that that needs a lot more time to un, unbake, but or bake out. But that's that's the other half of that conversation. That that's that's really good. I mean, my, my the, the most important thing I learned from that right now is that don't give someone the opportunity opportunity to say yes or no or being, you know, zero or one. Uh, just try to be a, authentic and add value from the first second. So that way they're really giving you some time to listen. They may say no at the end, but at least they're giving you the opportunity to to talk about your product or service. That's really great. Yeah, that's right. So look, we, we're out of time and we had so much more to cover that we didn't get to because thankfully you guys had a lot of questions, which we really appreciate and, and are always happy to answer. Um, if you guys want to stay in touch with us, th I, hopefully you can again see my screen. Colin and I have been trying to use this this time at home during coronavirus, again, to figure out how we can contribute. And one of the things that we get a lot from students and from people that attend our talks is, you know, where can we get more and how can we stay in touch? And for Colin and me, it always felt a little bit inauthentic to do the social media thing. And, and, and frankly, it still does. So one of the things that we're working on is figuring out how we can get content to you guys and how we can help more people in a way that really feels good to us so that it's not just, you know, the typical, we're getting an email every week and it's got self-promotion on it. We really want to try to find some, some things. So if you guys are interested in learning more, keeping um, in the loop about, about what we're up to um, as we try to figure some of this stuff out, we have some really cool ideas that we think are going to be a lot of fun. The best way to do it is to hit us up and, and link up with us on LinkedIn because we'll, um, we'll keep in touch there. And then certainly subscribe. So our, our agency website has a little slash subscribe page there. Um, and we, we will not pester anybody or anything like that. So if you're interested, um, please do join us. And we really appreciate you guys giving us a little bit of extra time today. All right. Yeah, that's I promise, awesome. I promise it was way funnier than what Garrett was today. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, same thing for us at Pismo Ventures. Please um, go to our website, pismoventures.com, and subscribe to the newsletter and to the social media and to the YouTube. Um, so we have a lot of content that's coming your way to help um, startups and entrepreneurs. Uh, Colin, thank you so much. That was so refreshing. Uh, Garrett, that was really, really awesome. Uh, different than what I thought it would be. So this is great. Thank you both. I, I hope everybody got a lot of value and uh, this will be recorded. Anyone can view it at a later time. We will post it on YouTube as well. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Take care.